of our second annual conference. Uh, we're joined today by John Craddus, MP for Dagenham and Raynham, an all-round top bloke, to talk about the place of class in a post-pandemic Britain. The event will be a Q&A format, so if you have any questions, feel free to send them to me via the chat, or if you, when the time comes, um, you can put the hand up using the little button in the corner and uh, ask the question yourself. But before we dive in, just a bit of background. John's been an MP since 2001, having grown up in the constituency, went on to serve. Uh, he saw off an ascendant BMP in 2010, led Ed Miliband's policy review, and has been a consistent advocate for returning the Labour Party to the communities that we were formed to represent, to a politics of work, dignity, and common meaning. He knows better than most of the dangers we currently face in the wake of our veteran defeat two years ago. Um, and with the local elections just five days away, the Tories currently holding a 20 point lead among the working class, there's no better time than the present to see just how we can get out of this mess. But you didn't see me want, want to come here to see me talk, so I'll hand over to John. Right, thanks for that, Joe. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Look, um, thanks very much for inviting me, and um, I very much welcome the opportunity to talk with you this afternoon. I'll just talk for a bit, and then we'll open it up and have a conversation. This is... The conversation, what I'm going to say comes from this book, which is just out, it's called The Dignity of Labour. Um, and it makes an argument, right, about labour. And it's driven by three sort of crises, if you want. First, there's the obvious crisis of the left, not just in terms of the UK, but across Western market economies. It appears to be in quite a perilous state. Um, second, about the rise of authoritarian populism, um, that actually challenges the foundations of liberal democracy. I mean, 30, 40 years ago, we were told that uh, history has ended, but it looks like it's literally been upended. Um, and obviously Biden has beaten Trump. But if you look across the globe, you see the rise of populist, right-wing, authoritarian forces. And I argue that is linked into questions of work and human dignity and labour. And the third element is an enduring productivity crisis that's gone on for about a decade with declining living standards and capitalism failing to deliver to our fellow citizens. So the book tries to dissect some of all that um, by returning to the foundations of what the left was historically. And historically, it was the party uh, to represent the interests of the working class. Um, now, that sounds so painfully obvious thing to say, that that is what Labour is. Well, in the book, I argue the crisis of Labour primarily is because of the last 20 years, through different forms, be they new Labour or some of the debates on the radical left, we've embraced a politics that assumes through technological change, the working class is on the wrong side of history, that it's literally withering away, that it has no future. And funnily enough, whilst we're putting forward those arguments, more and more working class people are turning away from labour. And I think the two are interrelated. That's quite a simplistic reading of it, but I go into a much more details about it. So um, a lot of the debate in and around labour at the moment is about, well, Keir Starmer has been in, in, in office for a year how's he done how's his shadow cabinet are they doing well are they doing badly how's he doing amongst a very small slice of the electorate in a few so-called red wall seats there's very little debate about the actual purpose character uh, and agenda of labor what is what is its role in modern society so i sort of jump into that because look um, the clock's ticking. We've lost four elections in just over a decade. We're 80 seats short. There's an 80 seat majority for the Tories. Given what's happened in Scotland, that we have a mountain to climb to win an, um, a majority at the next election. So we need to start talking about this pretty quickly um, because we need to. And there will be a big debate, I'm sure, after um, next Thursday when the election results come out. Partly pull all that, it'll be about um, what is the future strategy for the Labour Party. So I sort of jump into that. This is part, this is the first of a three part project. This is firstly about work. The next book is around the nature of community in the left. And the third is about rethinking human rights for the modern world, given the 
challenges of surveillance, capitalism, and technological change and the like. So this is sort of book one. Um, if you look at Biden, for example, his 18 million jobs plan was built around the idea of jobs you can raise a family on and ensure free and fair choice to anyone to organize and bargain collectively. And I think that's quite a good start for the left. There's an awful lot of talk around FDR in the 30s, uh, but I would go in a different direction and look at FDR in the 40s in North America. In 1944, he argued in a um, State of the Union address that we should consolidate new economic and social rights into the Constitution of America, the right to work, the right to free education, the right to housing, the right to security, the right to public health. I would argue those forms of rights we should update now for an agenda for the left, um, alongside the duty on all, poli all political representatives to stop the degradation of the planet and use that as the organising politics for a renewal of the left. Now, a lot of people think that's that's pretty that's pretty obvious, but it's not really because where I sort of engage some of these debates is around let's call it a new socialist imagination that is detectable across the left, which you can see in debates around automated communism or post capitalism or a world dominated by bullshit jobs, where we sort of in some of the language that is used, we seek to invent the future and imagine a world without work. Usually linked into debates about universal basic income. Now, I think this is a really interesting debate. There's a lot of very interesting stuff in it, but it's based on a specific reading of Marx, whereby I don't want to go, don't go into the details of this, but there is a certain rereading of it which sees labour as dematerialising through technological change, right? So labour is an increasingly marginal element of the direction of capitalism. So within this, what, as labour is removed from creating value, the working class withers away and capitalism will soon transition to a new liberating era. It relies heavily on quite a deterministic reading of technological change in the future. Um, it's fascinating. It's intellectually agile, but it seemed, to me it's deadly as a political strategy because the danger, and we know this is a big danger for Labour all the time, is that think about the membership of the party. 72% um, of Labour's members come from social classes ABC1, right? Increasingly, its demographic in terms of who votes for it is very specific. Um, there was a poll out, I think you alluded to it, Joe. We are 20 to 25 points behind amongst working class voters now. Even in London, right, where Sadiq Khan is heading for a 20 point poll lead, we are, lo we are losing amongst working class London voters. The gradual, the electoral map is being redrawn. So we increasingly draw from um, social classes ABC1 in university towns and urban settings. Um, whilst the Conservatives increasingly draw their votes from working class communities. Now, some people see this amongst working class voters. Some see this as a symptom of a Brexit realignment. Whereas I see it and argue in the book, this is a, a longer term 20 year reconfiguration of British politics along class lines which is partly linked to the Labour Party through various iterations, deserting the working class through thinking it's withering away through technological change. So this form of deterministic thinking, whether from New Labour or on the radical left today, um, confidently anticipates the direction of capitalism. It literally thinks that capitalism is going to end and transition to a benign, liberating world of abundance called post-capitalism or luxury communism. And within this, um, we're all going to have joyful, liberating lives. And it's built around what's known as the fragment. There's, there's a few pages in Marx's Grundrisse, which were notebooks before the epic capital was written which are taken out of context, mainly by an Italian writer called um, Tony Negri, uh, who's obviously highly influential now across the European left. 
when I was younger, he was a very marginal figure, but he's now redrawn the, the nature of Marxism and the radical left into what is often described in Italy as the post-workerist movement, right? So the danger is an obvious one, where Labour becomes the post-worker party, right? Now, Labour, the party of Labour, is becoming a post-worker movement. Some argue that it should jettison the working class as its base, and instead there is an urban networked youth that is the new agent for a global multitude. This is basically the thinking intellectually amongst parts of the left. Now, I started my life in the building industry as a construction and got involved in the unions. And to me, the cornerstone of the left was the fight to stop the degradation of human labor. Right? That was the axis across the whole politics of the left. That's not to mean it was laborist or, or too contracted, but that was a that was a hallmark of left politics. And to me, what's happening is quite dramatically, the left is changing character and it's lost or is in danger of losing a politics grounded in the politics that confront the degradation of work because of these assumptions of the trajectory of history, capitalism and the dematerializing of labor. Tony Blair um, embraced this thinking. My job in 97 in Downing Street was on the minimum wage, union recognition, rights for workers for a couple of years. And continuously, we were battling there um, to get more out of the Labour government because a lot of very clever people at the centre said this belongs to the past, this agenda. And there's a new knowledge economy waiting for us that if we can just tap into, we don't need any of these old Labour remedies because the world of work's changing. Funnily enough, amongst the radical left, this is the same sort of drumbeat that's represented itself. Um, now, I think that's awash with trouble, that sort of stuff. And so therefore I've sort of constructed a counter argument that means that Labour should rebuild a politics of work, not in the sense of an old fashioned sense, but to deal with the modern degradation and reconfigure a politics for the left built around questions of human and dignity, including the dignity of Labour. Um, I think that can get us out of this trap game because at the moment, we are trapped in these binaries of age, leave, remain, whether you live in urban or suburban, whether you have a degree or you don't have a degree, whether you're young or you're old, and we are trapped so that we only play on one part of the pitch. And the danger is neighbour will never win again if it doubles down on this strategy that sees the working class as being disinvented. To me, that's a form of demographic determinism alongside a form of technological determinism. And the cumulative effect is that labor is just truncating, it's shrinking. And um, coincidentally, it's losing support amongst precisely those people, groups of people who are, they th you, we think are on the wrong side of history. If you disrespect people, I would, su I would suggest you've got less chance of getting their vote. Um, so I think this needs an about turn it better happen pretty quickly. We better put the jump leads on this stuff in terms of having a proper discussion about where Labour is, because by stealth, in terms of who the party membership is, who votes for it, some of the ideological assumptions about the direction of capitalism, we are way down this road in terms of the party changing its fundamental character. So really, it's a lament and it's a contest around some of these arguments. It's not popular. The Blair crowd won't like it. A lot of the people on the radical, the parts of the radical left will hate it as well. Um, I'll give you an example. Paul Mason is someone I like and his work has always been stimulated. Just written in um, the New Statesman this week that unless Labour embraces a post-work politics, it will become an irrelevant. Here's my estimate to you. If things don't go too well over the next few elections on Thursday, Hartlepool is obviously looming as well. Um, the solution to our problems amongst working class voters is not to double down and say, well, we believe in a workless future. That seems to me to create a canyon between us and huge swathes of the electorate, which were built on 
decent, dignified, secured work, which is what we fight for and try and give people as a central element into what they think is a good life. So these are not sort of abstract theoretical arguments, even though I go into quite a lot of theory. Basically, the book's divided into two. The first half of the book goes into the three different economic traditions that have dominated economics, all of which are built around specific approaches to human labor. First is sort of the classic political economy of Smith, Mill, Ricardo. Second, the history of Marxism. And third, neoclassical or neoliberal economics and how they've debated over the, especially in the post-war period, to inform politics and condition political programs. I'll go through all of that. And then the second half of the book looks at labour from a more ethical take in terms of trying to rebuild a moral case for socialism built around human dignity and the case for dignified work, well rewarded. And in the back end, I go through about 20 pages, about 30, 40 specific policies ranging from new forms of union recognition, industrial democracy, the right to work, um, redefining the worker to deal with some of the gig economy questions of contractual service, all of that stuff. So there's a lot of policy in the back end. And I also enter into the debate around universal basic income. I am very sympathetic to a lot of the arguments around the universal basic income, as we've seen in the furlough program, which is a sort of proto UBI. I'm less convinced if it's seen as an antidote to automation, because I go through a lot of the literature on automation and there is no evidence that work is ending, that the robots are coming. These are political choices. We've got to shape the politics of work to create more liberating, dignified employment, well rewarded, um, rather than just giving up on the politics of work, because that's what I think is actually happening here. Um, and there's only one people who benefit here, and that's the employers and the right. So it's a sort of it's an engagement with some of the fashions in and around the left at the moment, which frustrate me. Um, but also, I think it's trying to rebuild a different character to a future left politics. Um, and we'll see how we go with it. I mean, I haven't got any skin in the game here. I've been an MP for a long time, been around the track quite often. But the state of the modern Labour Party, I found, I find profoundly depressing, profoundly depressing. And um, we've got to engage with some of these arguments very quickly, because I fear if we don't, we could get to a position where we, we cannot recover. And that is what sort of drives the contribution, which is a fear of the future and what's happening. So Joe, by way of introduction, that's sort of where I'm coming from, you know? Um, I've sort of jumped around quite a few things there. Um, but if, if you want to ask any questions or, or um, throw a few, hit me with both barrels, whatever you want to do, have a, have a conversation about it. Um, Cause I do welcome the opportunity to just kick around some of these things. And I think it's great that you're having a, a two day conference to, to discuss the nature of work. And I know you've had a conversation this morning around the role of unions in modern society and stuff. And that's something that is a sort of companion piece to this about the role of new institutions to, um, confront the degradation of work today and what we're going to do about it. So there's a lot in the book um, and I've just sort of jumped around a number of the themes in it, but hopefully that gives you the sort of sense of it. It's trying to push back around the sort of inevitability of the end of work and the end of the working class, because I just think that's a recipe for disaster for the left, if that's the politics that we embrace for the future. Oh, thank you, John. That was Pretty informative and bloody fantastic, I thought. So uh, I've got a couple of questions coming in, but I think there's one that I would like to ask you first. Um, so obviously there's a lot of talk of, you know, Boris Johnson's sort of blue collar conservatism and, you know, whether it's either all talk or is actually, there is something there and, you know, maybe he can cement his actually, his very working class support. Um, do, you, do you think this realignment could be permanent? I think the jury's out, right? I think there are some around Johnson, some of the cleverer people who I know, I know they are because I've talked to a few of them. They see this as equivalent to 1979 and Margaret Thatcher's 
um, victory then, which redrew a new electoral coalition uh, amongst uh, conservatives, partly through council sales, council house sales and the like, but they created a new co cross class coalition. And they think post Brexit that they can reconfigure a new class alliance across what they what is called the red wall. I hate this phrase, the red wall and left behind communities and all this sort of stuff, because it's also happening in London, which is the point I made earlier on in terms of this is not just in 40 seats in the North or the Midlands. This is everywhere. This this is every constituency, you know, has different class elements to it. But they're very, very um, determined to do this. And you will see them shoehorning money into specific constituencies, infrastructural projects. Um, they will double down on cultural battles to try and wedge open Labour around a lot of uh, cultural battles, and that will be pretty rancid, it's politics. And they'll try and develop a more communitarian theme um, as alongside a big and different economic offer where they will not be able to go though joe i don't think is around questions of labor and labor protections because that is such a powerful legacy of the thatcher revolution that i don't think they'll, they should do um theresa may played around with um, that she set up a taylor review about modern employment practices and um she played around with putting workers on the boards but the conservative party wouldn't let her do it boris johnson's promising an employment bill but in reality, that anti-Labour, I don't mean Labour as a Labour party, I mean Labour as an economic and social category here, that anti-Labour agenda is so hardwired into Conservatives, I don't think they'll be able to become the workers' party that some of them think they could be and should be. And they think that Labour's left this open. And I would add, Johnson's success, or otherwise, partly depends on what we do. You know, if we, if we, if we say, yeah, yeah, go ahead, you know, we're off somewhere else. We're, we're going to double down on this um, argument around post-workerism and um, double down on this new... You see, they're trying to find a new coalition, and arguably so are we, you know? And the danger is we could help them and they could prove to be more successful in this because of what we do into, or what we don't do. Um, so that's partly why I wrote this, because... Um, I'm fearful if we get this wrong and we make some false choices over the next period, then we could be in all sorts of trouble. I do think Biden's interesting in this, by the way, because he's managing to bridge different caste coalitions and progressive and more traditional democratic voters um, through a radical economic strategy and a radical environmental strategy. I was talking to someone close to him um, the other day and they said the two drivers are they're going to have a, a really radical and uh, environmental agenda and a real radical and equality agenda based around trade union strength in the future and i think that is a really interesting way of trying to get out of this binary thing and create new coalitions for us that's what i think labor should do here but to do that we have to contest some of these fashions that take us in a very different direction which um to me are a total blind alley um, in terms of um, renewal of the left and rebuilding a coalition. Labour historically used to be, David Marquand used to talk about a progressive dilemma about how the middle class and the working class components stay together in and around la la Labour politics. It's only a dilemma if you recognise it as such. If you think that that dilemma no longer exists because one part of it's disappearing, then I, then I think that's very, very worrying. And that is, I feel, one of the dangers of what we're doing at the moment. So is Johnson for real? No, I think he's a total charlatan. I think the wheels fell off for a few days this week as well, and there was a bit of an unravelling of him. And, you know, I think it reminded us that they, we've had a decade of austerity, botched NHS reorganisation, doomed EU renegotiation, you know, David Cameron, the sleaze elements, you know, Matt Hancock's barman getting PPE contracts. Well, you know what I mean? That, that sleaze thing began to detonate at the heart of politics again. 
But I still think a lot, we can't rely on them to blow up because they are so shameless in their desire to retain power. They will do literally anything. And we can't allow them by playing on a different part of the pitch. We have to contest this and not just write off the working class and assume it's reactionary, dying out. through age and technology and around. The Tories, well, it's all up for grabs, basically. So. Thank you. I mean, I saw a, an interesting article last year written by a 2019 and take Tory, talking about how Tory party should structure itself more like trade unions and have benefits for members, et cetera, and work with them. So, you know, the, I, I do think the jury's out, but there's some interesting and kind of horrifying ideas there. Um, so question from Sophie. Uh, John, do you think that UBI could be used as an excuse for the government not to ensure that people have access to fulfilling? Oh, did you get that? Oh, sorry, you're muted, John. Sorry, I just froze a, get a bit then. Sorry, I've, I've missed yeah, my, that. My internet's not amazing. Um, so, a question from Sophie. Uh, do you think that UBI could be used as an excuse uh, for the government not to have access? The fulfilling work yeah i do i think that's a very good way of putting it um don't get me wrong i think there are some really interesting elements to the debate around ubi um but i mean you know there are right-wing arguments for ubi there's left-wing arguments for ubi there's liberal arguments for ubi there's re you know classical republican visions of ubi in terms of its vision of just Milton Friedman backed it, you know, um, all sorts of very libertarian arguments for UBI to dismantle the state and have an individual financial transaction between the individual and um, society. Um, I, I dislike it based on the arguments about the march of the robots and the inevitability of, well, because it gets a lot of the tech companies off off the hook. That's how that's how I see some of this stuff. And I also go through the evidence in the book. Maynard Keynes argued 70 years ago that we're going to have a, you know, a working age of week of under 20 hours because of technological change all throughout history. The end of work's been anticipated, but it's never come through that way. And it's a political contest. I think, you know, and I fear that behind the backs of the UBI debate does lie some deterministic views around the future direction of technological change that um, gives up the game. I, th I see some arguments in favour of UBI as a sort of I give up policy, you know, I give up on work, contesting work. Um, and I'm fearful about that. But as part of a an overhaul thing to change social security systems and, you know, the the sanctions regime and humanize the welfare and benefits system, it has got a role. Um, a more humane rights-based model of social security reform is much needed. And um, so, you know, you could see child benefit as a form of UBI. You know, you could see a reformed universal credit as a form of UBI. Um, it means different things to different people. And I'm just fearful about some of the arguments around UBI, but at least it's a big idea, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, a question from Ben. He says, a vision for work is so important, but where would you include those out of work, the unemployed, the disabled, etc., in this? And would you support things like a higher minimum wage such as uh, that Biden has proposed? Totally. I mean, in the book, I go through um, schools of policies, which I won't recite now, but a lot of it is about strengthening the inspectorate, strengthening the minimum wage, um, strengthening rights to for disabled workers in the workplace. Um, a constitute, I'd argue for a right for every citizen to work in decent, well-rewarded, dignified employment. Um, it should, we should recast this as a human right and a demand for every citizen. Um, and we, we have to make work, the politics of work, the central to the future agenda of Labour. Um, now, again, that sounds so painfully obvious, 
Um, but it's not really, if you look at a lot of the debates around Labour, whereby they see um, work as a sort of nostalgic, old-fashioned idea, some of these debates. And uh, I fear, I fear if we go down that track, as I repeat myself, we could be um, consigning ourselves to history as well. Um, and there's one other point. Political parties aren't just here to chase votes, you know. They are born of histories and traditions. Um, and the Labour Party is traditionally the party that seeks to civilise capitalism by civilising employment relationships themselves. And I don't think we should give up on that too quickly. Um, that's fundamental to our vision of justice. Um, and if we're going to have a change, if the party's going to be something else, you know, you could call it the, I don't know, you could call it the post workers party, you know, because that's what a lot of the movement comes from post workerism. Well, good luck with that. You know, I mean, um, we could do that. And we're sort of happening. That's sort of happening quietly anyway. But we should debate it. That's, that's my argument. We should have a conversation about this rather than by stealth, the party turning into something that it historically wasn't. So I'm big on employment rights, I'm big on new union organising capacity. Um, it's interesting that Joe Biden, he said, he, he, did say, he, said his, he said, these 18 million jobs that he's going to create, all these jobs should be paid enough to bring a family up and every and you have a right to be organized and with union representation i mean that works for me you know and if they can do it over there when you've only got 10 percent union membership we're here with about 23 24 percent if they can do it we should be way ahead of them in terms of trying to engage and push this agenda yeah i saw joe biden he started some sort of task force to expand union membership which they didn't even do in the 30s over there, so it's pretty uh, pretty exciting. Uh, Rachel asks, what should Labour do to address the gig economy and growth of self-employment? Yeah, again, um, a lot of this is around... I argue that a lot of this, the drivers to the gig economy is because employers can redefine the worker so they're not a worker actually i'll give you I'll give you give, give you an example of this in um what's his name you, you take take what's happening every day you, if you pick up the guardian or any newspaper you find countless examples about how work is increasingly politicized nowadays so you had british gas Gas workers, three to four hundred British gas workers were fired and then selectively rehired on the basis where well, they weren't. Those three to five hundred, they lost their jobs. But there was a fire and rehire strategy by British Gas uh, Network. Rail have tried it. Tesco's have tried it. Take these Deliveroo drivers. Some of them are on two pound an hour average through the course of their um, shift. And their chief executive officer stood to make 500 million on the float of Deliveroo the other week, right? And he was saying that his workers didn't want to be classified as worker. I, they didn't want health. They didn't want sick pay. They didn't want holiday pay. They preferred to be contractors, right, rather than employees, which is absolute nonsense. But the gig economy proliferation is because they're allowed to do it. Right. I would argue that if you go on and you take take on Uber, take on Deliveroo, the gig economy and say we will not tolerate the why I use the word dignity is because it's a powerful word about what we tolerate as a society. You know, the dignities of work in the modern world around the question of gigging probably shine a light on what we are as a society. So that's why it's dignity is something that you, you lose, the negation of dignity in terms of what we tolerate in terms of forms of degradation, ex, you know, exploitation, uh, inhumanity. And so I think that's a good word for the left to operationalise around pushing back around the indignities of modern work.
the gig economy is an absolute outrage in terms of some of the things that are perpetuated there. And they should be at the top of our agenda in terms of saying we're not going to tolerate that as a society. Um, because that's the form of justice that we're going to embrace. And the pandemic, the question about the pandemic to me is, does it give you an opportunity, having confronted death as a society, if you will, of deciding, well, we're not going to live like we were before? Because obviously the Tories, Boris Johnson, are desperate to get us back to how things were before the pandemic. We've got to say, well, we don't want to go back there. We want to have a different you know, notion of justice to, to you know, reimagine the world going forward. Um, and I think that should be rebuilt around questions of dignity, both in terms of labour, access to socialised medicine, rights to housing, you know, right to debt-free education, um, and the right not to have a inhabit a planet that is being degraded through um, it literally burning up. So that sets an agenda for, I think, quite a radical future politics for Labour. Um, where we'll go down that road, I don't know. Um, but it's it's crying out. It's sitting, it, it's hiding in plain sight, if you want. You know what I mean? It's just like there, to me, that sort of politics. And I think it goes with the grain of what people want, because I think the pandemic has reminded us of the precariousness, not just of our work, but also of our lives. And it forces us to rethink how we want to live again. At least it should, not just individually, but collectively. And Labour should be able to speak to that. Oh, totally. Um, and on a similar vein to that, uh, Anushka asks, do you believe that social democracy is the only future of the Labour pot in the UK? Uh, it's good. It's a good question, that. Um, I, I think Labour to me is, uh, is, is a coalition of both social democratic traditions and socialist or Marxist radical coalitions. And that's what we have to preserve. It has to be a pluralism about it. So different traditions can, can coalesce. I come from the more, well, historically, the more socialist traditions, if you want. Um, but I think we have to create a culture which is generous, which is fraternal, which is courteous, which is respectful of different traditions, you know? Because my fear is actually that a lot of the culture around the party is pretty grim at the moment. You know, it's a lot of factional um, stuff going on. Um, I was, I'll, I'll be perfect, but I was um, against all of the votes of no confidence about against Jeremy Corbyn and all that sort of stuff, because I thought you have to respect the leader um, who re-elected to office whether you voted for him or not. I didn't vote for Keir Starmer, but I sort of support him because he's the leader of our party. And if we don't support him, it's difficult to make the case for other people who are not in the party to vote and support us at elections if we don't you know, retain that confidence in the leader. Um, but I just want the party to rebuild as a coalition of classes, of interests, of different geographies, um, different... Uh, because the... To echo the point I made earlier, the danger is we're, we're shrinking, right? We're shrinking in terms of our class composition, our education, our, you know, where we live. Um, and I fear that might mean that we may prove impossible to, to create sufficient breadth to win again. Now, we'll see. Um, so, but there is an urgency to this that we have to think through and correct pretty quickly um, because, you know, I, I couldn't vote in 1979 when Margaret Thatcher got a power. And I, my, my youth, I went to university, instead of all 18 years was when the Tories were all powerful. And I don't look, you've got more skin in the game than I have in this because I've been around the track a few times, but I don't want you to have to experience what I did in terms of having to live under right-wing governments for literally decades and i fear that might be happening again um i think we've only got enough time for for one more question um so gordon brown has recently started on uh, a campaign for a jobs guarantee uh, anna sarwa's scottish labor has run the platform of, of a youth jobs guarantee this old-fashioned keynesianism 1970s style you know uh, 
politics or is it the future? I like it. I mean, I, I mean, I would like it because I've been saying Labour needs to rebuild a policy as well. I'd like it to go further because the, dan the danger is it, it, it's a simply a youth unemployment scheme, right, programme. And I'd like it to be bigger. I want a constitutional right for governments to provide work for all its citizens, right? That's, and it has to be decent, well-rewarded, organised work. That's where I would go, which is sort of bigger than, you know, um, a youth unemployment guarantee, which I understand why, but I'd like us to go bigger than that going forward. A part of a massive fiscal expansion. Yeah, Keynesianism, yeah. But I, the reason why I make the point about FDR, Keynesianism, yeah, I take the point about spending a lot more, you know, um, in terms of a fiscal stimulus, but I'm not a Keynesian. I think we need to redesign the architecture of the economy as well, rather than just spending the money to reflate it. We need to change the trajectory of capitalism um, and rebuild the character of both the country and the economy by democratising it much more dramatically than a lot of traditional Keynesianism would, would imply. Well, I mean, I think that brings us to the end. I mean, we're at yeah, 45. So 